Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. I'm grateful that you're here today. I know it's uh, tempting not to come up because of the air quality. I know it's difficult, but thank you for joining us. Just before our worship begins, uh, a few announcements. Uh, first off, uh, there's a few things here about how you sign up for our weekly updates and other important email updates. So if you find uh, that you've not been sort of being keeping up to date and that there are various things going on in our parish, there's information on how to sign up there. You also get to sort of choose about what things you learn about. So if if you are interested in our Wednesday Bible study, you can receive updates, but if you're not interested in that, you can choose other things for your preferences. So it's a very easy system. Also, after our service today, starting at 1130 is our memorial prayer service. And so memorial prayer we undertake uh, every other month, and this is done in order to remember those who have died, those who have been uh, have accessed our funeral services from the parish as well. And so that will be at 1130. It will be here in the uh, sanctuary. We'll also be a broadcast online. So I hope that you're able to join us and uh, to have the chance of naming those who have died, to remember them and to be reminded that God will always remember them. And that's the goal, to comfort us with the knowledge that they're never forgotten by our Lord. Lastly, uh, as you uh, may have noticed, we have um, prayer bookmarks available in the uh, foyer, and those are there because they are the long-term names, the ones that are on for a very long period. So they won't be appearing in the bulletin. We thought it would be easier for you to remember them in prayer in your own home prayers is to take that home and maybe put it in your prayer book or Bible, and that might allow you a reminder to pray for those who are in long-term need of prayer. So without further ado, I'll invite you to stand. And uh, we'll begin with our opening hymn. You'll find that the uh, lyrics are presented there on the screen. We sing hymn 527. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit 
that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage about us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear. Preserve us all from unbelief. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, and go down forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear our readings from the Bible. Reading from the book of Genesis. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. No, the matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abram, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him, a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. This morning's psalm is Psalm num number 86. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Angela, I think that's the second page. That's the first page there, and then it goes there. Right there. Oh, I turned it over. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry. You're absolved. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, bow down your ear, O Lord, and answer me. 
for I am poor and in misery. Keep watch over my life, for I am faithful. Save your servant who puts his trust in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for you are my God. I call upon you all the day long. Gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving. And great is your love toward all who call upon you. Give air, O Lord, to my prayer. And attend the voice of my supplications. In the time of my trouble, I will call upon you. For you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. Nor anything like yours. All nations you have made will come and worship you, O Lord. And glorify your name. For you are great, and you do wondrous things. And you will honor God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Knit my heart to you, that I may fear your name. I will thank you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. And glorify your name forevermore. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the devil's pit. The arrogant rise up against me, O God, and a band of violent men seeks my life. They have not set you before their eyes. But you, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion. Slow to anger and full of kindness to truth. Turn to me and have mercy upon me. Give your strength to your servant and save the child of your enemy. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. I invite you to stand for the gospel reading. The Lord be with you. The holy gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. 
Jesus said, a disciple is not above the teacher nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. But I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, and even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The Gospel of Christ. Christ. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Let's have a seat. Some Sundays, preachers are given uh, not many good choices to, <laughs> to preach. Uh, in uh, Genesis, we hear about um, how it is that Ishmael and his mother Hagar, that had um, she had slept with Abraham, Abraham sends her away with this child into the desert. That's a tough story. We hear Jesus speaking about how you're going to be hated and how you'll divide households, and that's a tough story. And in Romans, we also hear the difficult story about how we are dead to sin, and Paul talks about death and life here. Well, I don't have an answer to all of them. I will focus today on our letter to the Romans. But one thing I want to note is that part of the reason we find such difficult passages through Scripture is because life is difficult. We see the reality of family breakdown and division. We see times where people turn against us who should be there to support us. And we see times when things are very unclear to us. And yet, we keep bringing these things up in Scripture, not because there's always an easy answer. We keep bringing things in, these things up because it reminds us God sees those things. He's there with us, and he helps us through them. So although I don't have time to look at all of those passages, it is a reminder to us that in the messiness of life, God doesn't hold himself back, but cares very much about that messiness and the messy details we have to deal with. I want to speak to you today about Paul's letter to the Romans because I, wanted, I spent last week, I'll spend this week, and I want to spend next week as well looking at his letter to the Romans because it's a complicated letter, it's a difficult letter in a lot of ways, and for that reason we don't often examine it. And so I thought I'd take that opportunity because although the letter to the Romans can be a really difficult thing to understand, it also has really deep truths about who Jesus is, what he has done for us, and how we live our lives in the light of his resurrection. So before I get into the sermon here about Romans, I'm going to bring your mind back, if you were here with us during our Lenten series, uh, to a great movie called Groundhog Day. If you've ever seen that movie, you know why it's a great movie. It's basically about a man who is a self-centered, uh, arrogant man who is very full of himself and yet is also extremely cynical. He uh, is a weatherman for a, a news station, and so every year he has to go to Punxsutawney, a tiny town in western Pennsylvania, where uh, the groundhog comes out, and if it sees its shadow, you get six more weeks of winter. So this time he goes, and what's strange about it is, is that he falls asleep at the end of Groundhog Day, and he wakes up, and it's Groundhog Day again. And then he thinks he's having some kind of strange mental breakdown, but each night he goes to sleep, and each night he wakes up, it's the same day lived over, and nobody remembers the previous day except him. So at first, he's puzzled by this, but what you notice this narcissistic man begins to think is, well, this is actually a great opportunity. 
After all, there's never any consequences, which means if I go rob a bank, tomorrow nobody's going to remember and I'm not going to be arrested. If I go get drunk, I'm not going to wake up with a hangover tomorrow. If I go and, you know, do whatever I do, nobody's going to remember. It's life without consequences. I can do whatever I want. And so you see this long sequence of him living as hedonistically as possible, knowing there's no consequences to what he does. But eventually, he begins to realize that this is kind of boring, actually. And not only is it kind of boring, he feels a sense of despair because it's meaningless. And then he falls into a deep, profound depression. But what makes it a great movie is that it has a great a redemption arc where he begins to realize that the only way out of this is for him to stop living for himself and to start living for others. And that's what turns things around. I highly recommend watching it. It's a great family film, and it's something that I always enjoy watching. I probably have seen it a good 20 times and a good message. So I mention that not just because it's a great movie and I uh, get a percentage off of every time everybody watches it. <laughs> I say it because that movie actually, I think, reminds me a bit about the problem that Paul's dealing with in this letter. You may remember last week I talked about how Paul was very insistent on how the grace of God, the forgiveness and love of God comes freely. So he talked about Abraham and how the great father of the Jewish nation became famous for a faithfulness, not because he did a lot of great things and God picked him out and said, wow, you've really impressed me, Abraham, I want you to follow me. It's because Abraham had earned nothing, but when God said, Abraham, I want to show myself to you, I have a great plan for you to inherit this land, I want to make you a father of a great nation, and Abraham believed him. He changed his name from father to father of a multitude because he believed God would bring him a great multitude even though he didn't have any children at the time. He traveled far from his homeland to a new place because God had said, I freely give to you. And he did this in response to God's grace. So after Paul has been arguing this in chapter 5 about how God's grace is free, you don't have to earn it. What Paul is thinking now is, I'm sure some of these people that are reading this letter have questions. I mean, if you think about how it will work when you and I have a conversation and I say something or after my sermon today, you've got a chance to debrief in the foyer or after during coffee hour to say, you know, I have a few follow-up questions or you're out to lunch or whatever. But Paul, of course, is writing a letter to people so far away that in the ancient world, it'd take months for the letter to get there, months for the letter to come back. And so it would have been typical for Paul to write a letter and say, here's what I want to say, but I want to anticipate questions you might have. And a question he wants to ask, or he figures people will ask, is the question that the weatherman asks himself when he's trapped in Groundhog Day. If there's no consequences, if what is forgiven and forgotten the next day, why don't I just go and live selfishly and do whatever I want? People are, would be saying to Paul, I'm sure your question is, if freely God forgives, he wants to show you his love, he cares for you, you don't have to earn it, then why bother? You can go out and sin, and God will say, you know, don't worry about it. And so Paul imagines the question people would ask. What are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order to gr that grace may abound? Well, unsurprising probably to you, his answer is, by no means. No, that's not how it works. And so this section of the letter is really spelling out why does that argument not work? Why is it wrong to say, well, God forgives, so why don't I just go out and sin and let him forgive a lot? Here's the first thing. Paul mentions that this is a misunderstanding of what Jesus has done for us. Because when you understand Jesus is coming to forgive sins, full stop, and that's it. You have sold Jesus short in what he's actually come to do. Because what Paul says is that he has not come simply to forgive our sins. He has come to kill our sinful nature so that it no longer plagues us. Now, in order to understand why that's significant and what I mean by that, I want to give you an example of something that I uh, was part of in the diocese. Now, I'm the Secretary of Synod, which is just what it says on the tin, right? I got to prep meetings, put the agenda together, chase down people who are late in their reports. But one of the things that I do notice sometimes is that people will ask me questions over time about, well, how do I deal with this or this? And it became clear over time as we talked with other members, uh, senior staff in the diocese, 
diocese that there's a few gaps in how the diocese runs in respect to risk because maybe not every uh, community has enough insurance. Maybe they haven't vetted their children's workers to make sure they have no criminal record. Maybe there's other ways in which there's real risks attached to parish ministry that we need to do something about. And so what the consensus was is that we should put together a risk committee, and that's what we did to sort of evaluate risks. But here's why I mention this. Because we asked, well, what should we call this committee? And our first thought was call it the risk committee. But, of course, what, apart from the confusion about us enjoying board games, what the risk committee didn't fully communicate is, is that what we recognize is we aren't actually there to eliminate risk. Risks will always be there. I mean, you can be as careful as you possibly can, and you could still get struck by lightning. And that can happen with the church. So what it named itself eventually was not the risk committee, but the risk management committee. There is a level of risk inherent to human life, so the best we can do is manage it so that it's as minimal as possible, but to recognize we can never eliminate it. That's it. I'd like to suggest that one of the confusions we often have about what Jesus' ministry is, is that we tend to think of Jesus not as the one who came to eliminate sin, but instead the one who came with a brand new sin management system. After all, you come, you make a mistake, Jesus forgives you, and you go off again. But the problem with that, says Paul, is that it sells short what Jesus wanted us to do. And it also minimizes the reality of what sin is. Because St. Paul says sin is not just some small thing, and then we wipe it off the slate and start fresh again. Instead, he says that sin is something that's a disease of the soul that hurts us and hurts the people around us. In fact, what Jesus wants is not just for us to be forgiven and be relieved of the consequences of sin. What Jesus came to do, he says, is to put sin to death so that it no longer has power over us. Listen to what Paul says when he speaks about what Jesus has done and who we are in Christ. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Later, he says, we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin, for whoever has died is free from sin. Paul uses the imagery of death because he says, think of how stark it is. When a person dies, they are no longer capable of doing anything. And they are also incapable of being tempted by sin. You cannot tempt a corpse. The reality of it, as he says, is not that Jesus killed us physically, but he came to put to death that sinful nature that compels us to do things that destroy us and destroy others. When we are lowered into the water of baptism and brought forward, he says that is a very powerful statement saying that just as Jesus is lowered into the grave and brought forth in resurrection, we are lowered into the waters and brought forth. And like Christ, the old self is dead and the new self rises. And that new self is not meant to be a self that responds to sin. And so when Paul talks about what happens when sin is killed, he's saying, don't you realize that God not only wants you to be rescued from the consequences, he doesn't want you to do the thing to begin with. I think many of us know the challenge in our daily life of simply being relieved of consequences, but finding that that's not enough. Think about maybe you've had struggles in giving up smoking, for example. One of the challenges that you have sometimes is you say, I'm going to give up, but all your friends are smokers, right? So you go uh, to, to work in the office, and you used to always go out for a smoke with your buddies, and then what happens? Well, you step out for a breath of fresh air, and you notice all your buddies there are smoking, and then one of them offers you one, and you say, eh, one won't hurt, and then boom, you're back to a pack a day, right? One of the great problems is, is you may say very well, well, God forgives me. Of course, I mean, it's not that you're doing something evil. It's that you keep coming back to a situation that leaves you with a bad cough and exposes yourself to health risks. It's what happens when you have alcohol addiction, for example. Yes, of course, God forgives you. But do you enjoy waking up with a hangover or feeling shame and regret each morning when you get out of bed? What Paul tells us that he says he wants to crucify this. He wants to put this thing to death for us so that we no longer suffer that strong temptation that we feel we cannot fight. 
What Jesus came to do is not put sin to rest, not to stun it, not to make it pine for the fjords. Jesus came to kill it. And you've got to recognize that Jesus came to do this thing because he wants to free you. But the second part of that, Paul says, is not just that Jesus wants to kill the sinful nature. He wants to give you the gift of a newness of life. I think one of the things that is sometimes a criticism of, of Christians, and sometimes, let's be honest, is really fair and right, is that Christians throughout history have often not been known as joyful, free-spirited, free people. They've been known as sourpusses, stick-in-the-muds, the kind that shake their fist in the face of sin, and every time somebody wants to have any fun, they're there to kill the joy. Sometimes Christians have that because they recognize the danger that sin represents, but what they do not recognize is the newness of life and the resurrected life that Jesus came to bring. Paul says the second problem with having this sin management idea about Jesus is not just that you don't let yourself be freed from the impulse to sin, you also don't let yourself experience the joy and the grace and the resurrection power that Jesus wants to give us. When we think about what Jesus came to do, it is more simply than to destroy sin, it is also to give us a new life. Listen to what he says about Jesus' death and resurrection. If we have died with Christ, we believe we also will live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. One of the great gifts Jesus gives us is that, yes, he helps us resist temptation, but he also gives us the grace to shape our life in accordance with Jesus' life. I've spoken previously about how in our creation, God creates us in his image. And that means not only that we're people who have certain faculties of logic and emotion and things that resemble who God is, God also gives us an important task of walking in right relationship with him and with the world. Jesus gives us the power to do that. To walk in newness of life is to be a people who no longer fear death because we trust wholly that Jesus has conquered it. We no longer fear the temptations of sin and we can sit down with tax collectors and sinners and love them because we know that Jesus' grace exudes from us and allows us not only to escape temptation but also to love those who are hard to love. Jesus is loved by so many who have gone astray because his grace was so great that it attracted them like a magnet. They wanted that quality of life that is joyful, that is free, that walks with his head held high, free of shame and guilt. And Jesus says, I came to bring that to you, not only to put to death the sinful life, but to give you a new life in which you can walk just as Jesus did to be a living example to this world about what a free life, a godly life, a grace-filled life looks like. And it is an enormously attractive life because this world struggles with the consequences of its bad actions, but it also struggles with the reality that even when it sees that something needs to change, it finds itself unable to change it. By walking out of this place each day a little bit more filled with God's grace and a little bit more trusting of his newness of life, what we can do for this world is to show this world that there is an alternative. You do not need to sink in despair just because you find yourself struggling with impulses that hurt you. There is a Lord who died so that this might be killed in you. And there is a Lord who rose so that you might have grace and peace and strength to walk and let go of the shame that has haunted you. Let go of the guilt that has haunted you and let go of those weaknesses that bring you down again and again. But in the meantime, we also know that he is one who understands our weaknesses and will love us even as we struggle to be that person. So what is St. Paul telling us? The matters we talk about about the gospel are matters of life and death because we embrace the death of sin and also we embrace the life of grace. Let Jesus truly do what he came to do. Let him fill you with this grace, put your trust in his grace and love, and see what he can do in empowering you to walk that new way of life, free of fear, guilt, and shame, free of anything that drags you down, and instead a bright light to a dark world that so much needs his hope. Let us pray. Lord our God, we pray that you would bless us with the deep knowledge of what you have done for us. We recognize you forgive us, we recognize you love us, but sometimes we don't recognize how profound your actions uh, are. You came to reach into the very depths of who we are to destroy those things that seek to destroy us, to break those chains that extend so deep into our soul. 
We pray, Lord, that you would take free reign in our lives to weed out anything that still clings to the old life and instead, Lord, to embrace fully the free life that you give to us. Let your grace fill us. Let your grace seek out every dark corner of our lives so that it may be infused with your light. And help us to walk out of here knowing what it is like to be forgiven, but also what it is like to walk with you in harmony, knowing that we're loved and accepted and always part of your family. Bless us today, Lord, with this knowledge that we might go out into this world so often plagued by shame, plagued by hurt, and to let this world know by our demeanor, by our actions, by our attitude, that there's another way, a way that you freely provide to all who want it. And help us, O oh Lord, to know that you will be with us always, even to the end of this age. Amen. Let's turn now to the Apostles' Creed. This is a summary of our faith and what we believe as a church, and it reminds us of the depth of Christ's love for us by laying down his life and rising for newness of life. Please stand as we say these words together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to sit or kneel as we pray the prayers of the people. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, for your mercy is great. We pray for all who confess the name of Christ, for our parish of St. Paul's and all who worship with us today, for our sister churches throughout Canada, Catch the Fire, St. Mina and St. Caris Coptic Church, Community Bible Church, and the Community Life Church, for Shane, our bishop, Bill, Nash, and Stephen, our parish clergy, for our parish ministries and for those who lead them, Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Hear us, O Lord, for your, for your mercy is great. We pray for those whose lives are bound in mutual love and for those who live in celibacy, for those who are isolated and lonely and those who struggle in their family life. Be their joy and their strength. Hear us, O Lord, for your, for your mercy, mercy is great. For all in danger, for those who are far from home, prisoners, exiles, victims of oppression, for frontline health workers, first responders, and all those whose work exposes them to risk, grant them your salvation. Hear us, O Lord, for your, for your mercy, mercy is great. For all who are facing trials and difficulties, today we remember those whose names appear in our prayer list and those we now name silently. For all who are sick, for those who are dying, and for those who mourn the dead, show them your kindness and mercy. Hear us, O Lord, for your, for your mercy, mercy is great. We pray for one another. May we always be united in service and love. Hear us, O Lord, for, for your, your mercy is great. We pray to be forgiven our sins and set free from all hardship, distress, want, war, and injustice. For every place disturbed by violence, unrest, or disaster, we pray for the friends and families that are mourning the loss of those who died in this week's Canadian Forces helicopter crash, and those who were lost at sea in the submersible accident off Newfoundland and on the capsized ship in the Mediterranean. We pray for those impacted by the wildfires across our country and those who are working to control them. Hear us, O Lord, for your, for your mercy, mercy is great. 
May we discover new and just ways of sharing the goods of the earth, struggling against exploitation, greed, or lack of concern. May we all live by the abundance of your mercies and find joy together. Hear us, O Lord, for your mercy is great. Hasten, Lord, the day when people will come from east and west, from north and south, and sit with all your saints at the table in your kingdom, and we shall see your Son in his glory. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners, and he invites them to his table. Let us now confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand. May the peace of our Lord be always with you. Please turn to your neighbor and exchange a sign of God's peace. Peace be with you. So in just a moment, I'll be preparing the table for communion. We'll also be singing our offertory hymn, which will be up there on the screen. And our sides persons will also be taking up our collection. So I'll direct your attention forward as we begin to sing together.
Let us pray. Eternal God, you have made our Savior, Jesus Christ, the head of all creation. Receive all we offer you this day, and renew us in his risen life. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living Word, through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so we won for you, a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross, that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread and gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, you do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, let us pray.
We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. The gifts of God for the people of God. receive communion with us today. Uh, I'll begin by asking our musicians to come forward and receive. Once they've received, our sides persons or ushers will indicate the right time to come forward. And they'll invite you row by row. Our practice is to line up here in the central aisle to receive bread from me at the center. And if you'd like to receive the cup, my assistants will be to my left and to my right. And if you'd like to receive the cup, go straight to them. If you prefer not to, you can walk past them and return to your seat. We also have gluten-free wafers available for those who have difficulty digesting wheat. Please let me know when you come forward. I'll be very happy to give that to you. I should also mention that if you're not um, planning to take communion today, uh, you're welcome to still come forward and ask for a blessing. And I'd be more than happy to bless you and to pray that God uh, keeps you and strengthens you and encourages you. So this time should not be a time of exclusion, but instead a time where all are invited to be blessed, whether you receive communion or not. We'll ask then for our musicians to come forward, and once they have received, our ushers will come forward as well. The body of Christ, which is given for you. The body of Christ, <coughs> the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, given for you. The body of Christ.
Please stand. Almighty God, guide and protect your people who share in this sacred mystery and keep us always in your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, be with you now and always. Amen. To direct your attention forward, we'll be singing our closing song, Let Streams of Living Justice. Peace to love and serve the Lord. Peace to God.